If you're ahead of me, you know it's found in Luke chapter 23, Matthew chapter 27, Mark chapter 15. But we're looking in Luke 23. Luke chapter 23, verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Let me read you what Matthew 27, 50 says. You don't have to turn there. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Mark chapter 15 verse 37 says, And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. Father, we pray tonight as we think about what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross and how that he gave his life, he laid it down. We pray, God, you would help us to understand tonight that they did not kill him. We pray, God, that you will help us to understand tonight that in the midst of outer darkness, God abandoning him, God forsaking him because of our sin that was laid upon him, even in the darkest hour of his life, Lord, he could still cry out with confidence, Father, into thy hands commend I my spirit. Father, we pray you'll help us to glean from this tonight what you would have us to have in Jesus' name, amen. Even in his death, even after six hours on the cross, even after such agony of spirit and soul and body through Gethsemane, through the trials, through the mockery, through the beatings, and through the crucifixion for six hours, it says he cried with a loud voice. Now that stood out to me. I've been around the deathbed of a number of people. Have you ever seen them get real loud after they get real low? (laughs) Usually the situation is if they're trying to talk, you're, you're cupping your ear, you're getting down. I've had to get right down over their face sometimes to hear what they were trying to say with just a whisper. But it wasn't a whisper with Jesus, was it? It was a loud voice, a strong voice. Uh, letting everybody know that this is not a physical situation where i have just worn out and and you're, you're taking my life from me. I believe that Jesus let it be known through that loud cry, and two of the evangelists made note of it, that it was a loud cry. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And God helped Jesus to die in strength and in, and in power. This... Uh, Most people believe that this is a quote from Psalm 31. Did you realize that this, at least most of this phrase is in Psalm 31? Jesus added the Father to it. He added Father, and then it says in Psalm 31, Into thine hand I commit my spirit. It's found in Psalm 31. So he was quoting, not only was he praying in his darkest hour, he was quoting scripture. And, you know, folks, as we think about the example that Jesus has left us, Prayer is is appropriate in all seasons of life. And the more we pray in the good seasons of life, the better we'll be able to pray when it's dark, when it's dreary, when there's problems and concerns. And Jesus was in that mode. He He had learned to pray. He had learned to lean upon his Father in his humanity. He had learned to look to God in prayer. And God had not ever failed him, and God had not ever abandoned him up until this very hour. And he knew why. Jesus understood why he was that way, but uh, I believe tonight that he said that and he quoted scripture. He quoted that scripture from Psalm 31, 5, into thine hand I commit my spirit. You know, it, it looked like the Romans killed him. It looks like the Romans took his life, but I believe there's some verses we ought to consider Before we come to that conclusion, John chapter 10, verses 14 through 18, he said, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine as the father knoweth me 
even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. That's the first time in this passage. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, comma, because I lay down my life. That's the second time. That I might take it again. Not only did he, was he expressing that he had power to lay it down, but he's also expressing he has power to lift it and take it back up again. He says these words, no man taketh it from me. So did the Romans kill him? They did not kill him. Jesus gave his life. Remember that. That's, to me, that's an important part. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. Three times in that passage, he said, I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. He chose the time of his death, not his persecutors, not physical exhaustion, not, uh, not even the, the, the loss of blood and all of those things that were taking place in his body. He was physically in bad shape, there's no question, but at that very moment, at the very time of the evening sacrifice at three in the afternoon, Jesus chose to give his life. He chose to give up the ghost. The word ghost there is the old English uh, for spirit. The word in the Greek is pneuma, just like Holy Spirit, Holy Pneuma. It's, it's, it's a word that means breath, it means life itself, the Holy Spirit, uh, but it's the same word, uh, pneuma, in the Greek, but his final words were that he was going, he said, I commit my spirit, and he gave up the ghost, or he gave up his spirit. His, his spirit was returned back to God, just like our spirit will return back to God. He chose the time of his death not his persecutors. The final words of Jesus and the dying Savior were a prayer. For six hours he hung on the cross. Three hours he suffered at the hands of Satan and ungodly men. And for the last three hours he suffered that sense of abandonment by God, which is certainly the most horrific part of his, of his death. But he had spent his whole life in communion with, with the Father. He said, Father, I know that thou hearest me. Thou always hearest me. Isn't that a wonderful confidence that Jesus had in his relationship to the Father? The Father testified about his Son several times while he was on earth. This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. This is my Son. Hear ye him. The Father testified of his approval of Christ, but Christ responded back so many times. Father, I know, but because of thee that stood by. That's why I said that. I know that you always hear me. What a wonderful relationship he had in prayer with his heavenly father. And you know, if God the Son needed that heavenly communion, if God the Son needed that closeness and faith and trust in the father while he was on earth as a human, how much more do we need it? How much more do we need to cultivate that life of prayer, that life of communion, that life of, of interchange with God to where our trust and our confidence is such that I know you, Lord, you always hear me. He doesn't always answer me immediately. He doesn't always give me the answer I've asked for, but he hears us. He knows what's best. And thank God for a father that will not just give us everything we want, but will give us what we need. And Jesus was in that relationship with his father in such a way that it was natural for him at this dark hour, and it was still dark. If you read all three accounts, it was still dark. You know, I would have thought that since he's praying again, maybe, maybe the light's coming back on, maybe the, the time of separation has passed and he now feels the father's presence, but the, the evangelists make it very clear that it was still that darkness, still that, that shut out. Uh, feeling from God that must have been there, but it was natural for him to, to do the two things he did. One, which is quote scripture. He was very thorough at that. He was very proficient at that. And why would he not be? He's the author. Him and the Holy Spirit are the author of the word of God. Why would he not be proficient at the word? But you and I are not the author, so we need to study it. We need to remember it. We need to put it to our mind and, and bring it to our remembrance and use it in prayer and use it in witnessing. 
How much of the scripture do you use daily when you talk to God? How much scripture do you use daily when you talk to someone else? We need to give them a biblical answer. When people are talking and, and the opportunity comes to insert something spiritual into the conversation, we need to insert the word of God. That's what's quick and powerful. You could tell them your theories, you can tell them your philosophies, you can tell them your ideas and notions and opinions, and that may help them in some degree, but the word of God is the infallible truth that they can anchor their soul to. So how much should we use the word of God? When Jesus was tempted, he used the word of God, did he not? He rebuked the devil with scripture. And time and again, he quoted scripture. Time and again, he referred to scripture. He illustrated uh, messages from scripture. He used the scripture to validate his claims. He used the scripture to validate his ministry. Jesus used the word of God. We need to do that too. Because one of these days, we're going to get down to a dying hour. You realize that, don't you? Some of us more keenly than others. We're coming to the end of our journey. We don't know how soon. We don't know how quickly we're coming. But when we get down to the end, we want to have that confidence. We want to have that assurance. We want to have that faith that says, God, I know you're listening. I know you care. I know you're taking care of me. No matter what the circumstances look like, in spite of the circumstances, Nancy Davis' song said, I will trust God. I will believe God. And that's where it gets down to, where the kind of the rubber meets the road kind of thing, where we realize now we must have God. We must trust God because there is nothing else. You know, medical science can only go so far. They can only do so much. We thank God for what they can do. I think of that little baby that had the open heart surgery. In fact, they can cut your chest open, put valves in your heart, sew you back up, and you're still ticking. That's, an, that's a marvel to me. I, that, you know, that's just an amazing, amazing thing that they can do that. And they can do it on a little baby whose heart must be real little and valves must be real little. You know, they, they do some amazing things, but there's limits. And it gets to the point where, you know, our body has deteriorated. Our strength has ebbed until the point there's no more that medical science can do. But God. But God will be with us. To live is Christ, to die is gain. We must ever keep that in our hearts and minds. That if we are called out of this world, we have a home eternal in the heavens whose builder and maker is God. We have an inheritance that is undefiled, incorruptible, that will endure forever through the ceaseless ages of eternity. Your house in heaven will not decay. There are no termites. There is no rot in heaven. There is no decay in heaven, not physically, not mentally. Thank God for that one. And not even in the natural elements, whatever. Heaven must probably be built out of totally incorruptible material, I would imagine, since the streets are pure gold. But I believe tonight that we can adopt the attitude and develop through a lifetime of prayer and a lifetime of devotion, a lifetime of trust and communion, we get to the end of this journey, we can do like Jesus did in this darkest hour. He still believed God. He still trusted God. The final words were a prayer. He added the word Father to make it very implicit who he was talking to. I had uh, the only real pastor I ever had was Brother Hubert Brown for just a little while, six months or so maybe. I don't remember exactly how long we were there, but he was our pastor. And uh, he said, when I pray, he said, I always start out my prayers with the Lord God of heaven, creator of heaven and earth. He said, I don't want the devil to ever misinterpret that I'm talking to him. <laughs> He rules out all the other gods. He said, I talk to the creator God that rules and reigns in the heavens. And he said, I, I just make it very clear to anybody that's listening. I'm talking to the one true and holy creator God. And I don't know if you feel the need to do that. I, I haven't felt the need to do that. I know my father knows. I know my father knows who I'm talking to. And if the devil doesn't know yet, he's way behind the curve. He's way behind the curve. If he hadn't figured out who I belong to, and he ought to know who you belong to. But Jesus made it very plain. I'm talking to my father. The relationship, the kindred, 
spirit that he had with his father is such a, a wonderful, unique thing. And it, it wasn't about his earthly possessions. It wasn't about his, his estate that he had left behind. He didn't leave any estate behind. He wasn't worried about doling out all of his goodies and stuff and, and making sure the right one got the right thing. That, that wasn't any concern to him at all. But his spirit was of great concern. And friend, our spirit is the most priceless thing that we have. It's the spirit that the devil's after. It's the spirit that the devil and sin attacks. Sometimes he attacks the body. Sometimes he attacks the mind. But he's after the spiritual part of us that can talk and commune and fellowship with God. Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I commend or commit my spirit. And he was doing his own committal. We preachers that have had funerals, usually you know, and I'm sure you're aware that the committal is usually the last thing that's done. It's usually done at the graveside. And, uh, you know, usually the minister will say something like ashes to ashes and dust to dust. From the dust thou came and to dust the body shall return. And we commit the body back to the earth from whence it came. And we commit the spirit unto God who gave it. That's the committal. Jesus did his own committal. He preached his own funeral that day. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And friend, every one of us need our spirits totally committed to God. Now, in this life, now while we're living, and also when we get to that final stage of life, it says he prayed that final prayer, committing his soul back to the Father, uh, and Jesus was there to do that and to make sure that everyone understood that. And he gave up the ghost. We would say he died. Physical life left the physical body. But there's a few things about his body that were even different than our physical body. When we talk about the body going back to the dust of the earth from whence it came, every one of us will see that. Our bodies will see that. Our bodies will decay. And it will go back to powder and dust one day. And that's okay because we're not going to need it any longer. We're going to have a new body one day. But do you know Jesus' body did not suffer decay? His body did not see corruption? Even in his physical form that he took, I believe God has glorified that. I believe the Father has glorified that physical form. And I believe the prints of his hands and, and feet where the nails pierced him, I believe that that will be the only sign of this current earthly system that will be in heaven when the new heaven and the new earth are administered will be the fact that our Savior still bears the marks of that awful crucifixion. But his body did not see decay. He was laid in the tomb for three days, parts of three days, and he was there for a very short time. His spirit was working with the underworld, with paradise and I don't know if the antediluvian world got an opportunity to repent or not. I would like to think maybe they did because there were many, many, many thousands of people probably that never heard Noah preach. I don't know how God deals with that. That's a totally up to him. That's way out of my pay grade. I, don't, that's, I, I can't answer to that. I'm already in water too deep for myself this evening because here is Christ, the son of the living God, dying for me. How am I to explain that? How am I to get to the very depths of that and realize the agony and the pain and the suffering and the separation and yet the relationship that he had with the Father that never wavered. It seemed to never waver by his committal. It never wavered. I want that kind of blessing. I want that kind of experience with God. But it says he gave up the ghost. But then something very significant happened when he did that. You find it in Mark 15, 38, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. <clears throat> in Luke 23, 45, the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. In my mind, I, I, I see the high priest entering or getting ready to enter the Holy of Holies, which was only for him. Under that economy, one man, he had to be the high priest himself. And that one man could only enter that, that area, that cubicle, one time a year. 
And before he could enter, he had to offer sacrifices, blood sacrifices for his own sin as well as for the sins of the people. He had to do that. And before he could enter in, he had to wash. He had to be prepared. He had to be uh, everything that the law required him to be. He had to be because he was getting ready to enter into the presence of the Almighty God. He was getting ready to enter into that Holy of Holies. One man is all that was allowed. One time a year, that was all that was allowed. There were many circumstances that had to be completed to make it able for him to go. But now, but now, in the end, in this plan of redemption, in our economy, in the New Testament gospel, Jesus has rent the veil. It's torn in two from the top to the bottom, giving access to God to every believer. Can you imagine? Can you get a grip on that? That God, Christ provided access to the Father to you. You don't have to be a high priest. You don't have to know anything about the high priestly office. Jesus is now our high priest and he's offered and given us access to the Father through the shedding of his blood, through the giving of his life, through the resurrection of his body and soul. He gave us access into the very presence of God. Now that's very, very important because it rules out two things. It rules out an earthly mediator. It's good to have people help us pray in it. It's good to have someone, if you don't know anything, kind of give you some idea, maybe lead them in the sinner's prayer. It's good to have some human help in that, in that process if you don't know anything. But friend, if there's no one else around, if there's no other soul that's able or qualified to give you any spiritual advice, you can come to Christ in prayer and talk to Christ and come to the Father through Him and find forgiveness. You don't need an earthly human being to come and and take you into the presence of God. In fact, they can't do that. In spite of what the Catholic Church declares, in spite of their high and holy priesthood, which are mostly pedophiles, in spite of all of that, in spite of everything that they teach, that you must come and confess your sins to a man, God forbid in this economy that we would ever imbibe such a doctrine. We are free to come into the very presence of God through Christ and confess our sins and find full deliverance and forgiveness of our sins because the veil separating the holy place from the most holy place has been rent. And it was rent at the time he gave up the ghost. It was torn from the top to the bottom. Now Herod's temple was the one that was in existence at that time. And in some of my studies of years gone by, and I didn't look it up, I should have looked it up, I could have given you the dimensions of that curtain. It's big. It's thick. No human hands could have torn that curtain. A good sawzall would have bogged down about halfway through it probably. But God himself took the curtain, ripped it, tore it from the top to the bottom, exposing the Holy of Holies, exposing the, the inner chamber, the inner sanctum, where only the very most religious person could go. Now the sinner can come and come through Christ and the blood of Christ and enter into the very presence of God through him. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful tonight that we have access to God through what Christ has done? The fact that he gave his life, the fact that he he surrendered himself to complete and finish the plan of redemption, you and I have eternal life and we have access to God. He is our mediator. He is our high priest. And you come to God through him. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus, right? Because Jesus is our <clears throat> substitute. He's the, he's the merit that we go to the Father through. I don't come to God and say, God, do you remember me? I pastored for 34 years. Remember me? <laughs> no, no. Father, your son bled and died for me. And there was a time and place where I accepted that wonderful sacrifice. And the precious blood was applied to my soul. Father, there was a place where I became a child of God through Christ. Father, through your Son, I'm asking you. I'm entering your presence. I'm entering your communion. Through Jesus. That's our access. That's our door. He said he was the door. He said he was the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He's the one we need. And by, through, by and through him, we can come to the Father. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. We don't need another human being. We don't need to go and tell someone else what we've done. We need to go straight to Christ and tell him what we've done. And he will intercede with the Father to secure the forgiveness on the merits of what he's done. Not on the merits of what we've done. 
It's a glorious thing. It's a glorious thing. But access to God has been made available through the death of Jesus Christ. And we see there in that passage of Scripture that the centurion, he was greatly affected by what he heard. It says here, when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God. Now, can you see that old Roman pagan heathen guard over there with a spear on his shoulder and a sword on his side? Praise God. Praise God. I don't know what he did. It said he glorified God. He must have done something. He glorified God. Here's a, a Roman. He's not a, he's not a believer. He may be now, but he wasn't a few hours ago. He was a Roman. He was a guard. He was an executioner. He was one of those people that were heartless and cold. And now we see when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God. Certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that sight, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. And all his acquaintances and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off beholding these things. Then, of course, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea comes and begs the body of Jesus. And he takes it and puts it in a clean linen cloth. Gives him his own tomb. He's not going to need it very long. Hardly going to get it dirty. He's only going to be there a few hours. Friday was an awful thing, folks, but Sunday's coming. Jesus is coming out of the tomb. They, he gave his life and he died. He didn't swoon, he died. And that's the reason they didn't break his legs like they broke the other two thieves' legs because he was already dead. But just to make absolutely sure he was dead, the spear came and pierced his side. Forth came water and blood. But I thank God tonight for what Jesus has done. I thank God for what has happened on the cross. I thank God for the messages from the cross. I wish I could have done a better job bringing them to you, but I pray tonight that God would help us to get a glimpse of who he is and what he's done for our souls. Shall we stand?